Yeah, we've uh, we've had a fantastic morning already. Uh, the brilliant Amber case has already warmed us up with some amazing inspirational talk about uh, cyborg anthropology and uh, the links between technology and the biologicalness of things. And I think we've heard the word evolution several times today. Uh, it, the inherent biological nature of evolution is something uh, that writers like Kevin Kelly have also spoken about uh, technology and uh, biology being almost uh, similar in their behavior, in their intrinsic uh, nature. I'm here to talk about revolution, and revolution as being something intrinsically man-made. It's something that we as human beings do when a certain track is preordained by uh, our biological destinies and technological destinies. Revolutions happen every once in a while and they steer us in a very definite di direction. And I believe, from my limited uh, understanding of uh, how things are happening around us, that we are right now in the midst of a revolution. And I call that the Interaction Design Bauhaus. And my talk today is going to focus on how we can learn from lessons of the old Bauhaus. How many of us have heard about the old Bauhaus? Can we just sh show our hands? Great. So uh, we know uh, I hope I'll have an easy time explaining myself here. Um, I'm going to talk about how the Bauhaus unfurled in the early 1900s and what happened after the Bauhaus and how we can learn from what's happening today. Uh, sorry, what happened back then, how we can apply that to what's happening today. So uh, very quickly, I'm Rahul. I Twitter at RahulSen79. Uh, I work at a multidisciplinary uh, holistic design agency called Ergonomy Design, as Paula mentioned earlier. They've been around since the 60s. Uh, I'm just going to uh, gonna talk more about my background in theater, uh, architecture, and interaction design, and I promise you I'm going to mix these up a bit. Uh, my hypothesis is that we are still essentially inhabiting built spaces and containers with scripts. And to talk about data and everything that we had in the, in the previous session, uh, very nicely pointed that in, back in, that, in this direction. And I believe our Facebook newsfeed is still our social courtyard. And our devices and tablets that we are consuming all this media with are containers. And we are still living in these containers, even though they are in our hands or they are in, in our living rooms. And these containers and courtyards are what we hold conversations and connections with. So uh, I'd like to begin with, by a very, very uh, inspirational quote from Kevin Kelly and his amazing book, uh, What Technology Wants. And in this book, he says that a shelter is animal technology extended. And quite simply, this extension is the technium. This is what technological evolution is within the spectrum of the technium. And I believe that while making these new shelters and containers for interaction within our mobile tablets and our applications, we are kind of in a stage in that evolutionary process today where we have a slight dilemma. We're not quite sure yet if we want these to still look backward into our physical worlds and try and mimic like uh, our sort of Alice in Wonderland app that we just saw where we want to try and mimic our physical environment or whether there's something new, something authentically digital that we can really strive for and work with as new materials. And I believe whatever I want to say today has been best said by Mark Twain who said, history seldom re repeats itself but every now and then it often rhymes. And I believe history is rhyming today. And the interaction Bauhaus that is now happening right before our very eyes has certain very similar uh, phenomena around it that mirror the events of what happened in the Bauhaus during the early 1900s. And I believe that what we learned from that old Bauhaus might just help us in thinking about how we move ahead in our future today. So let's rewind a little bit and go back to 1800s and have a look at what we were creating in the form of shelters and containers. Our shelters uh, were sort of, here we're talking about style, so we, back in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, we had Gothic revival and uh, sort, of a, a sort of strong envy of nature, and we loved our forests and our trees and our um, natural environment habitats so much that we wanted to mimic them in our physical uh, spaces. So you saw beautiful Gothic churches uh, that resembled forests and uh, of course, material and structure had a strong role to play in how these spaces were created. But you also had furniture that sort of brought about this world of leaves and very organic uh, uh, material in a very literal way into our everyday surroundings. 
That reached its height with Art Nouveau and Arts and Crafts. And of course, I'm not a historian, so some of these facts might not be 100% sort of, there might be certain things that I missed out, but uh, if you look at history of architecture and design, this is kind of how it unfolded. You had Gothic uh, revival, and you had Art Nouveau, Arts and Crafts, where people went berserk with floral patterns and ivy, and here you have Victor Horta's Tassel House. Amazing, it's beautiful, but very, very inspired and almost literally inspired by nature. I mean, in that you almost feel like you're sit sitting in, in a forest and it's made with stone and wood. Out came Mies van der Rohe out of uh, the early 1900s and said, enough, less is more. And with that, he gave birth to the international style, as uh, most of you would have uh, been familiar with and the best example that I could think of for that international style is represented in the Barcelona Pavilion where Mies and all the other designers of his uh, movement said let's strip architecture and design of all the clutter, all the baggage of uh, our envy for nature and let's start afresh, let's start with basic principles, let's appreciate space for what space is, let's appreciate form and order for what it is and material for its authenticity and its purity. And that gave rise to a whole new world of principles and, or, and, a, and a movement that was uh, encapsulated by the Farnsworth House, by the Barcelona Chair, and these have become sort of landmarks in their own day and age. Uh, and they celebrated sort of the purity of uh, structure and form. So just to recap that little uh, 100 year uh, phase in our industrial design history, we had Gothic Revival, Arts and Crafts, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, the international style, and then boom, here came the, the Bauhaus. And what the Bauhaus did was reduce everything back to basics and bring about a new world of order and principles. So what it gave us was reduction in terms of um, the kind of elements that we were playing with, whether, whether it was space or painting. Uh, we talked about purity of a return to typography of order and structure and grids. It also focused on new methods of production because, uh, because you used tubular steel, because you used precast concrete, you were able to create a lot more uh, new paradigms of construction and order. And, of course, people like Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer were sort of, uh, they become legends in, uh, in our everyday uh, vocabulary because of that. But as uh, some of you might have seen this movie called Playtime by Jacques Tati, uh, this movie was classic in the way that it portrayed some of the points about the Bauhaus that people felt was sterile, inhuman, monotonous, and elitist. And uh, people quite, uh, designers loved the Bauhaus, but somehow people felt after a while that this wasn't really how they wanted to live out their lives. And so what happened next was that you got a movement that I think I understood as postmodernism, which looked forward, but also brought back elements from the past to move forward with. And let's take a quick look of, uh, at what postmodern postmodernism might look like, or does look like. Uh, you had um, uh, Frank Gehry, you had a whole um, bunch of designers and architects who did amazing work, but they referred to a lot of wit, reference, uh, deconstruction of uh, spatial narratives and design narratives, and also a return to selective ornamentation to elicit uh, certain kinds of emotion at, uh, at the right times and the right places. So. Uh, Again, to summarize here, you had natural envy for a whole century, and then a sudden pause and a return to functionalism where a building was a machine to live in and you had to make a building look like a machine. But then the, the movements that came right after that revolution were talking about wit, reference, ornamentation all over again, but with a new look on that to the future. And I believe that history is rhyming today, as Hampus put it, uh, that history is rhyming today in the form of uh, products like the Windows Phone, or products like the Flipboard that you saw in Amber Case's presentation. And that history is, has, uh, uh, that uh, revolution is happening because of uh, a realism envy that we all are qu quite familiar with, that we've had with our desktop metaphors for quite some time now, where we, we loved our physical desktops so much uh, and our three-dimensionality so much that we want to take that into our digital spaces. So you have like diaries and notebooks that kind of look like our uh, physical diaries, little coffee cup in the corner, and you had like uh, the, the really well thought out, bumped up interface that tried to mimic our three-dimensionality in terms of physics. Uh, you also have this extreme sort of Baroque-like uh, uh, approach to uh, physical and in digital interfaces where you uh, create bookshelves that sort of store our digital books for us, that look like a real bookshelf. You had digital diaries that mimic our little tabs in our diaries, etc. And they're all there in very successful formats, but at the same time, uh, 
sorry, if you see the history again here, you have, and this is all happening very quickly since it's a very short history of interaction design that we're talking about. It's early graphical user interfaces, real world desktop metaphors, the web look, as people call it. And then you have extreme skeuomorphism where people have just gone berserk with glossy buttons and chrome and, and this whole fetish with, with phys physicality. And suddenly now you have the interaction design Bauhaus that's saying, hang on, let's strip this whole business back to basic principles and f focus on content rather than Chrome or authenticity in our digital experiences. And you have stuff like the Flipboard, the Puma phone, Windows phone, and many, many other apps that you find on, on the iPad and uh, the Playbook and all, all sorts of other uh, uh, containers. And I believe that the interaction design Bauhaus, if I was to try and frame it, is uh, something that can be, can be defined as a return to purity and honesty in visual interaction design experiences with a focus on content rather than Chrome and uh, a pursuit of authentic uh, rather than nostalgia and object envy. And I believe that, again, when you see Kevin Kelly's book on uh, what technology wants, he talks about archetypes and the archetype is ordained by the technium while the trajectory of the species is contingent, meaning that the, the archetypes are following their own pattern and rhythm that are preordained by their inherent DNA. And there's very little that movements can really do to influence that uh, trajectory. But what we as designers and users are doing and can do is affect how that individual species, an app, a service, how these things manifest themselves and move around in that evolution, we have that power to affect it. And I believe that's where uh, we need to be very careful in how we get carried away by our material resolution. And I, uh, if you look at our history of uh, the usage of plastics as a material or concrete as a material or paint as a material, they have always been introduced in their own time and then people have immediately fallen back on realism all over again. Plastic trying to look like wood, uh, concrete trying to look like uh, uh, na nature, like plants. Uh, you have um, paint trying to represent photographic reality and you have pixels when they have come about with our superpower screens trying to look like reality all over again. And uh, Yeah, the, what the interaction design Bauhaus, I believe, is telling us is that we need to go back to similar things like modularity, prefabrication in the way that we come up with uh, uh, our architectural construction, or abstraction in the way that we deal with our uh, metaphors that we use for our uh, in visual uh, interfaces, and a whole series of new drivers for construction that we probably are still discussing. And that's what this conference probably is, is uh, so important for. Uh, and we're still dealing with courtyards and windows and ceilings because that's in, in effect, that's what Facebook, Twitter, Comenta TV that Juan is going to talk about next. These are all essentially still courtyards and spaces that we are inhabiting. But we're still building this with new materials that are different from the ones that we were building them with uh, 10 years ago. This new material is very, very... Uh, clearly in the form of content, time, data, and a whole bunch of others, social as a very, very important layer on top of these new materials that we are dealing with today. And we need to understand that we still have lingering forms of envy in the way that we're dealing with these materials. And these forms of envy are physicality in the world of three-dimensional interfaces, uh, augmented reality that we'll hear more about uh, in the sessions after this, and gestures, our envy of our real-world gestures and our inherent need to mimic them in our, in our digital habitats. There's a whole bunch of others, but the important point that we need to understand as an audience here today is that the digital technium will evolve, whether uh, Nokia chooses to follow it or whether Apple chooses to sort of catch up to it. That's not important. The important thing is that the, the technium is evolving, and what we need to understand is that it will evolve towards probably will be similar to a digital postmodernism. And I'd like to end by defining that a digital postmodernism from the way I've understood it with this historical context might be a frame of reference that is drawn between newer authentically digital orders, structure and technology, together with older frames of wit, humor and human connectivity. And this dealing with material is what I'd like to end my presentation with and hand it over to Juan Melano, who's going to tell us a little bit about something that he's built, uh, and he uses social as a very important material in how it connects to this new authentically digital experience that he's talking about. So thank you very much.